to DMFA Digital Marketing for Asia. My name is Joanna and I am a marketing manager working here at SoftBank Telecom Europe. Welcome back to our series where we have a look at foreign brands who managed to successfully enter the Japanese market. Today, we will talk about IKEA. We all know it, we all love it, and we all own at least one IKEA item. The Swedish furniture giant is a part of our everyday life. Is this also the case in Japan? It may come to you as a shock, but IKEA has actually entered the Japanese market twice due to initial failure. But before we jump in, as usual, please don't forget to subscribe to our DMFA channel. Leave a comment telling me what is your favorite IKEA item. I think my favorite, uh, probably, <laughs> Probably this little, you know, those little kind of lunch bags. Yeah. Or the IKEA bag, the blue bag. Oh, and I really love those shelves. Those are my favorite IKEA items. Are you ready? Let's go. As usual, let me start with some background first. When I was doing research for this video, I found this information that actually blew my mind. So I never even thought about it, but do you know where the name IKEA comes from? Well, I'm glad you asked. IKEA or IKEA, the first two letters are the initials of the founder's name, Ingvar Kamprad. E comes from the name of the farm he grew up on Elm Tarid. Elm Tarid. I, I feel like I'm butchering these words. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to all the Swedish people. And A is named after the nearby village, which is called Agunnarid. 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 IKEA. Even as a very young boy, Ingvar, he just knew he wanted to be a businessman. He was like, I want to make my own money. And he took the first steps to becoming a businessman at the age of just five years old. He decided he's going to sell matches. From there, he moved on to selling things like Christmas cards, pens and seats, riding his bike around his neighborhood and selling to his neighbors. He was a good student and to reward him for his good grades, his father gave him a small amount of money, which smart Ingvar decided to invest into setting up his company. In 1943, at just 17 years old, Ingvar set up the very first IKEA company. At the beginning, it was selling household goods like pens, uh, picture frames and wallets. And the first furniture item was introduced to the IKEA range uh, five years later in 1948. Fast forward to now, as of August of 2022, IKEA has 474 stores across 64 countries. Today, IKEA has firmly established its presence in the Japanese market, having several stores around the country, yet it took IKEA two attempts to enter the Japanese market. Back in 1974, the brand introduced their products into Japan but sadly, they had to retrieve just 12 years later in 1986, failing to respond to customers' needs and expectations. Back in 1974, IKEA's new market entry strategy was more or less universal across the board. The brand has already spread to neighboring Northern Euro European countries like Norway or Denmark, as well as Germany, taking into account how close these countries were to each other. And I'm not saying close just in terms of geography and location, but in terms of the way of living and living standards, it was quite logical that the market entry patterns would work well in those situations. However, it was completely not true in Japan. So the first and only adjustment IKEA did before entering the Japanese market was to make their stores smaller. They did a market research that showed that smaller spaces and smaller stores look cozier and more inviting. 
therefore they seemed to be more easily approachable. Soon it became quite clear that the brand should have paid much more attention not to the size of the store, but to a size of an average Japanese household and the Japanese way of life to begin with. IKEA's biggest issue at the time uh, was the size of the furniture. Standardized dimensions that work so well in northern European houses simply did not fit the much smaller Japanese apartments. The second point that caused IKEA to fail back in the 70s, you have the large furniture that you don't have space for at your house anyways, but how do you carry it home? What are you going to do if you came by public transport? Or what if the item does not fit in your car? Well, of course you can get a taxi, but it would add additional costs to the total amount you would have to spend on the new furniture. And it is just the beginning of what you have to do in order to be able to use the furniture anyways. Because purchasing IKEA furniture is just the beginning of the IKEA adventure. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. IKEA is very famous for their DIY, do-it-yourself, build-it-yourself approach. And basically the financial idea behind this is that if they share the workload between the manufacturer and the end user, they will be able to lower the costs of the products. While simplicity of design and the Relatively easy construction is one of the core principles of the company. I think we've all seen those memes about assembling the IKEA furniture alone at home and really struggling. I know I've struggled many times and maybe I struggled where I where people usually do not struggle. Yeah, this also became a premise of many jokes outside Japan, but in Japan, however, nobody was laughing, okay? It was not funny for Japanese people and they did not find it entertaining. It is yet again the very big cultural difference between what we might be used to here in Europe and what people are used and what people expect in Japan. Customer service culture in Japan prescribes that the end user the customer puts as little effort as possible into purchasing the products or receiving something, looking from and understanding this perspective, I think it is clear to see that the IKEA products were much less appealing for the Japanese uh, consumers compared with other items in more or less the same price range. Not only do you pay the same, but then you also have to invest extra costs into transportation and then you have to spend hours on hours on building the furniture or failing to build <laughs> the furniture. And the third point was price versus quality. Obviously compared to other furniture retailers, IKEA is quite affordable. While they might not be using the most sturdy and high quality materials, the furniture tends to last for a long time and sometimes even longer than expected. Still, in Japan, quality is more important than quantity. While IKEA products may be easily changed or it's easy to replace them with new ones, the general tendency in Japan would be to invest a little bit more in a high quality item that would serve you years and years on end. Also, buying more expensive item and product from another retailer would also exclude the dimension related issues, as well as probably include the delivery, as well as in-home assembly into the initial price. compatibility, customer experience, and prices, IKEA was forced to withdraw from the Japanese market in 1986, and they started working on solutions and better marketing strategies. It surely must have been very difficult to take the decision to withdraw from such a huge market, uh, which is full of potential. However, IKEA really did learn a lot from this situation. In fact, many changes that they have developed later on for Japan were introduced to other non-Japanese markets as well and proved to be very successful. It took IKEA 20 years 
to reintroduce their products and services into Japan. And I think this can teach us all a very valuable lesson about adapting your products and services to the local standards. So let's take a closer look at the strategies that helped IKEA uh, to secure its place in the Japanese market by rethinking their marketing strategies. So they took into account the local ways of living standards. They addressed the customer's expectations while maintaining the pricing and quality. IKEA really did not want to give up on their cost-saving tactics of the DIY, DIY approach. However, the company had to find another solution that would suit the Japanese consumers. And this is how the IKEA delivery service was born. So customers could make a list of all the products they want and IKEA would collect those and send them straight to the customer for an extra fee. This delivery service has been later on copied and introduced across all stores in all countries around the world. And I think many of younger IKEA customers may not even remember the time where this was not an option. Like you, you could not have the IKEA stuff delivered to your house. The same goes for the DIY approach. If you want, you can order the assembly from IKEA experts for an extra charge. Interestingly, however, the company really never gave up on this IKEA DIY culture. They also changed the way they marketed this DIY approach by teaching the customers to enjoy the assembly process. In order to promote the idea, IKEA turned this into this very Swedish cultural treat that was actually very warmly met by the Japanese people. The company started emphasizing the importance of literally building your home together with your loved ones, not only by discussing and choosing the items you want to have in your house, but also by physically participating in the construction. Building your home together is a way to foster better and closer relationships. And people really seem to appreciate and enjoy the things they build by themselves more and for a longer time than those that they have purchased that were ready-made from the store. Another thing that was introduced was the flat pack system. On one hand, the flat packs occupy less space. And on the other, it also protects the product from any damages during the transportation. And it can also help to lower the transportation costs. The last point is that after 20 years of intense market research, IKEA had to finally understand the differences between the European and the Japanese standards. I think that if the company further denied the need for different sizes, it would just uh, end up in another failure, which is why eventually IKEA gave in and they took two steps to make their products more compatible with the Japanese households. So first of all, from the vast range of their products, uh, it was around 10,000 articles. IKEA selected around 7,500 articles that would match the standard par parameters of the Japanese homes. Items like large sofas, beds, uh, tables or other bulky items were removed from the Japanese catalog. And secondly, they changed the proportions of some of their products. So the furniture would fit into smaller studios in the city. And they also put more emphasis on smart storage as well as items that could either fold or collapse. To showcase how IKEA products can be used in your house, a newly opened Tokyo store had several showrooms fully furnished with IKEA goods. Show the customers how can they use the products to let's say create a cozy living space or a student apartment. And some rooms even uh, used tatami flooring or some cooking appliances that are common to the Japanese households. I think IKEA has truly embraced this small scale living in Japan and made it a focal point of their market re-entry strategy. So as we can see, despite some major changes, IKEA did not fully abandon its basic ideas and values 
when going to Japan, but rather took a spin on them and built more upon those basic values. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you could learn something new about IKEA's story and journey into the Japanese market. I think this is a really great example that is showing the utmost importance of really understanding the market especially the new market you're trying to get into and localizing your products services and marketing strategy to match the local audiences it also teaches us to never give up and to chase your dreams at the mfa digital marketing for asia we offer localization services so if you're thinking into bringing your brand and introducing it into the japanese market but you don't know where to start I will leave a link to the to a contact form in the description down below. Please get in touch and we will schedule a free consultation where we can learn more about you and your business and discuss the ways we can help you enter the Japanese market with a peace of mind. As usual, don't forget to subscribe to our DMFA channel and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell. We post a new video every Monday and yeah that's it for today so once again thank you so much for watching and i will see you very soon in the next one bye